welcome back. And we are getting ready to move into our conversation for today. We are joined by former Foreign Minister Lisa Schumann uh, to discuss the Belize Guatemala issue and, of course, take a look at the results of the referendum. Good morning Good and morning. welcome. Thank you. Now, we know that you have been very vocal about this issue yes. consistently. Yes. And you have played. Uh, you have been a part in an official capacity yes. uh, in different roles. Mm -hmm. Let me just get your initial reaction to the results we're seeing from Guatemala. The initial reaction is that no matter how Guatemala tries to spin it, mm -hmm. the voter turnout was an abysmal failure mm -hmm. for the government of Guatemala. They put in considerable resources, including presidential integrity, mm -hmm. and the foreign minister herself was a part of the push to get people not only to turn out, but to vote yes. Mm -hmm. In terms of getting those that did turn out to vote yes, that was a success for them. But that really is a no-brainer. Yeah. If I say to you, would you like a chance to win a wingle, all you have to do is turn up and tick a box that says yes. It is hardly likely that you will vote no unless there is a good reason for you to do so. Mm -hmm. What was an abject failure, and it doesn't matter how they try to spin it, was the fact that 75% of Guatemalans didn't turn out mm -hmm. to vote. To put that in perspective, it's as if in the referendum for Brexit, in the UK, 75% of people in Britain had not turned out to vote at all, and only 26% or so had turned out. And it doesn't matter that you tell me that previous referendums have been at 10 or at 18. The fact remains that 75% of Guatemalans do not think that it is important enough for them to leave their houses on a Sunday to come and cast a vote for any possibility of anything being obtained mm -hmm. by going to the ICJ. And that's a hugely, loudly negative message against President Jimmy Morales and his government. 5.5 mm -hmm. million Guatemalans Correct. chose not to participate. Correct. And, and less than 2 million did. Yes. And uh, as I had said in previous reports, they uh, did attempt to incentivize or, as they say, ease the process with free transportation and also mm -hmm. uh, giving public officers in schools a day off the following day so they would have sure. no excuse. Sure. None of that seemed to bring out the masses. None of it gave any huge percentage of Guatemalans any incentive to go vote. Yeah. Yeah. So that says a lot. Now, it does, but it also, and, and we've said it time and time again, that based on what their laws allow. Mm -hmm. A legitimate referendum can be five people, three say yes, two say no. So the percentage you, you of You do voters, realize this is theoretical, and I'll tell you why it's theoretical. Okay. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind mm -hmm. that some enterprising group of lawyers mm -hmm. will take the result that was obtained here and say, this is not a legitimate result for a democracy. Mm -hmm. In a democracy, the minority has its say, but the majority has its way. In this referendum, the majority didn't even turn up, mm -hmm. meaning that they have absolutely no interest in going to the ICJ mm -hmm. to settle anything. So that theoretically, you can say that if five people turn up, that's the result. But if you flip the coin and look at it the other way, that the other 99.9% .9 didn't even bother to show up, mm -hmm. then democracy would have to tell you that there is a totally different message being sent. Yeah. Any government in Europe, let's say UK, England, mm -hmm. Scotland, pick any of those. Both of them have had referenda throughout the years to either leave Brexit or for, or for Scotland to leave the Union. Any government who had put that much resources into a yes vote and had gone out and campaigned for it 
and there had only been a voter turnout of 26%, would be under immediate pressure to resign because that is what they staked mm -hmm. their reputations on. Governments in the UK have fallen. Brexit is a great but example. Yes, exactly. So that anyone who wants to send the message that there is any pressure on Belize for us to vote, yes, yeah. is not looking at this through the right lens. I, I'm glad you bring that up because there, there is a, a very important uh, question that I want to ask, which is, the People's United Party, as the main opposition, has been a part of the process, leading it at one point, Correct. and also being a part of the bipartisan commission, which you were representative yes. on, even into the signing of the compromise and immediately after. Yes. And let's, let's stick up in Let one moment. Today, I am speaking for no one except myself. Agreed. So I'm not talking for the People's United Party. I'm simply giving my perspective yes. as a former member of that bipartisan commission so and as a former foreign as minister. a former member as mm -hmm. a former foreign minister who supported this process yes what made you make a shift from saying this is the way to go to i don't believe that anymore no here's the thing i still believe that the icj is probably most possibly the best chance for a mechanism that Guatemala can respect for us to get a final definite binding resolution of the unfounded Guatemalan claim to Belize. Mm -hmm. What I do not believe is given the present conditions, particularly where several things hold true. One, up to the point at which on the 8th of December 2008, Wilfred Sadi Elrington and Harold Rodas signed a compromise at which both countries were going to hold simultaneous referenda. Mm -hmm. The conditions at that time all pointed to that Guatemala was going to keep its word on that and we were going to move ahead. At all times, Guatemala knew what the law in Belize was, that our referendum required a particular threshold. 60%. They knew that. So that is indisputable as to they understood the conditions into which we were entering the ring. And we decided, look, the only way for anybody to be able to be permitted to even take this question to the ICJ is it has to go to the people. At all times, I have been a huge believer of Belizeans being given all the facts, mm -hmm. pro and con, and that has to be in equal time. Between 2008 and 2015, there started in about 2014 to be a steady erosion of the conditions. Guatemala started shifting ground several times. They, at one moment, announced that we were going to referenda. Mm -hmm. Everything was being ramped up. They then called it off. I think at one point, commentators were so angry that Guatemalans were referred to as serial killers of agreements. But in 2015, something happened that caused me, at any rate, to undergo a serious shift. Anybody who doesn't change when the conditions change, something is wrong with them. Mm -hmm. In 2014, we went to Guatemala, and in good faith, following what was called the parallel track mm -hmm. arrangement. In other words, at the same time that we do struggle with this claim, we're going to try to be good neighbors the by agreement. signing a raft of 13 agreements. And I was present at the negotiation of those agreements as the leader of the opposition's representative. We were in Guatemala for two weeks negotiating this. Some of the text had already been drafted and we finished it. The deal with that was that the government was supposed to come back and before it signed, inform and consult the Belizean people as to what was being done. That wasn't done. The opposition was not invited to the signing of those agreements between President at the time, now disgraced Otto Perez Molina, mm -hmm. and Dean Oliver Barrow. It was signed in December 2014. In 2015, 
the Guatemala then Guatemalan armed forces then start exercising effective control over the SAR stone. And one of the first incidents, if you recall, was the incident of the Dore that was coming back from a visit to the Sarstoon to see the border markers mm -hmm. at the end, turning back and was diverted to Livingston yes. with a bunch of Belizeans, including diplomats on board. Mm -hmm. And ever since 2015, Marlene, Guatemala has sworn love and devotion to Belize while attempting to control our internal waters on the Sarstoon. I am sorry, but from where I sit, you cannot tell me you love me and beat me same time. You know, work that way. Mm -hmm. If you say we are brother neighbors or sister neighbors, and that will never change because it will never change, you cannot simultaneously tell me you want good relations and yet you consistently violate my internal waters. I, I want to get to that, but before yeah. that, you, you, you were leading so up to a timeline shift. at 2015. Yes. At 2015, there was also yes. the amendment to the special agreement. That, that, was the second, that was the second nail in the coffin for me mm -hmm. in terms of conditions on the ground. So the first one was Guatemala started to exercise effective control over the SARS-2, all mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. all of it, and blocking our passage to Sarstoon Island. Remind me to talk about Carlos Raul we Morales and that island. That's one. Two, the second one was the delinking of the referendum processes. To the day of today, no good reason has ever been given. Was the opposition consulted in this process? This no, was one was of the not. first agreements that no, was signed was with not. Guatemala that there was not an opposition representative. We, we were, were there. not consulted. Yeah. The agreement, in fact, was made behind closed doors between the foreign ministers and or the respective governments. The opposition was simply told, the Guatemalans want the process dealing. We don't have a problem with that. Kindly join us to witness the situation. At the time, Francis Fonseca was still the leader of the opposition. I was still his representative. And I was summoned to attend, to witness it. And I advised the leader of the opposition that if he required me to go, I would resign. Because I am not lending myself to any process in which I have not been a full partner. Yeah. We were not full partners, the opposition. And the opposition was simply told that this was a decision. Yeah. At the same time, we came under heavy pressure to change our referendum threshold from 60%. Now, let yeah. me remind you, this... Barrow administration in its very first iteration changed the referendum up to impose a 60% threshold. A 60% threshold which they then used against Oceania, by the way. Okay? And that means that 60% yeah. of the voters had to participate had to, participate to be able to legitimize for it the to referendum. Be valid, for so it had to be we valid had, valid. as in Guatemala, a 20% yeah. turnout, it would have been illegitimate correct and that law was changed in early 2008 just after the government came into power the and it was change. changed in around April and why do I remember this because that is one of the laws that I took mm -hmm. to the Privy Council in the Alberto Veos case in fact we managed to get an injunction on the constitutional change but what went through, because it was read first, was the change to the Referendum Act. And that was put in by the Barrow administration, the 60% threshold. Lo and behold, in 2015, they decide, uh oh, let's change that, because now it is too onerous. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we have. And at the request of Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Which the now opposition, removes the threshold the of opposition, the 60%. Correct. The opposition at the time was adamantly opposed to removing the referendum threshold only for referendum on Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Because let me tell you, Marlene, if there is one referendum on which the threshold should have remained, it should have been the one on Guatemala. If you can't get 60% of Belizeans to turn out, and I am confident that any time there is a vote, more than 60% will turn out, even if it is only to register a note. You're not going to get people to stay at home. Why not? Because it's an existential issue. Yeah. 
People will vote no for a variety of reasons. Let me, let me ask this question. Uh, uh, and I, you know, we were joined by Ambassador uh, Murphy last week, and, and, and yes. it was one of the questions that, that we had asked him as well. Originally, when the special agreement was signed for the joint referenda, right. both countries believed there would have been able, they would have been able to get a yes vote. Having yes. been a part of the signing of that special agreement, did you believe that in it had it been held October 2013, mm -hmm. I believe, yes. Belize would have gotten a yes vote? No, and I'll tell you why. So and why, why hold, on, hold on, stick up uh -huh. in, you ask me. Mm -hmm. Yes, in 2008, at that point, every attempt at either facilitated negotiation, which ended in mm -hmm. 2005 with the facilitator's report, which was roundly rejected by Guatemala. This is Guatemala rejected the facilitation. The next phase from 2005 to 2008 was trying direct negotiations. Mm -hmm. That was also a failure. And so the Secretary General of the OES said, look, you've been trying since 2000. You've given this an honest push. It's been eight years. Tremendous amounts of resources, financial and human capital have been spent in trying to settle this. Oh, no, no, go in no way. I just like you go on, one vehicle stuck in the mother, all you did are spin wheels. Mm -hmm. I recommend to you that you take some old pieces of board and try to climb yourself out. That attempt was to say to you, why don't you go to your people to see whether they will agree to go to the ICG? Go to your people. At that point in time, I thought it was difficult, but I thought sincerely, and I can only speak for myself, that if there was an honest effort on the part of the Belizean government to educate Belizeans as to the implications that, yes, there could be a yes vote. Mm -hmm. And I believe that every other member of the team thought so. Now, let me be very clear. It is difficult to be anything other than convinced when you're in the middle of the process. You're in the belly of the beast, and you're, you're seeing it differently. More information. Correct. You're seeing it differently than the people who are on the outside or even on the periphery. One of the people who I thought was most successful at being able to explain things to Belizeans clearly and confidently was the late Ambassador Alfredo Martinez. I don't know that we have ever had or will ever have a diplomat in Guatemala that will ever be as successful as Ambassador Martinez. He is one of my dearest friends, and I say that without any reservation. We did not share the same political views, but we shared the same deep conviction that what we were doing was the right thing. Now, however, mm -hmm. however, conditions do change, Marlene, and if you don't change to keep up with changing conditions, mm -hmm. there is a problem. And several conditions did change. As I mentioned, the first one was the SARS-2. The second one was the delinking. The third one was then the ramping up of aggression by people like Carlos Raul Morales. Mm -hmm. And when you start adding things up and it gives you a feeling of discomfort, coupled with the fact that I also did not and still do not personally agree with the way the government of Belize is handling all of these Guatemalan aggressions. I did not believe and I don't believe that there is any chance right now for Belizeans to vote yes. Let, let's backtrack a bit sure. because you spoke of, of the change in the interactions and one of the critical points that we're not talking about here is the change in presidency in Guatemala. Correct. And President Jimmy Morales, when he was campaigning, used Belize, the Belize issue, yes. as a part of his platform. Correct. And we saw a very different shift in even the rhetoric coming out of, of Guatemala. And it's interesting because you realize that Otto Perez Molina came out of a military tradition. Now let me Which lay is something at his feet, because it is at his feet. It wasn't until mid-2015 that his government effectively crumbled. So he was still firmly in control when Guatemalan armed forces started behaving badly on the SAR stone. But make no mistake about it, any Guatemalan political analyst worth his salt will tell you 
that Jimmy Morales is the chosen candidate of the Guatemalan Armed Forces. They went out big time for him. He wasn't even the front runner. He wasn't even really much on the radar. At best, in early 2015, he was a third rate political presidential candidate. Nobody knew he was, who he was, except as a comedian, yeah. a clown, yeah. who um, in blackface made rude jokes and um, made some very offensive racial stereotypical remarks mm -hmm. about black people that earned him some measure of popularity. So that's who Jimmy Morales was. When the La Línea scandal really hit Guatemala and brought down Otto Pérez Molina and Roxana Baldetti, the favored candidate then was a man by the name of Manuel Baldisson, who was the favored candidate of the Guatemalan economic classes. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the scandal stretched out even onto him. Who was left standing? Two people. The wife of former President Alvaro Colom, Sandra Torres, and Jimmy Morales. Jimmy Morales' campaign slogan is, I'm clean, I'm not a crook. That was his campaign slogan. And the Guatemalan Armed Forces went out big for him. It is thought because they believed that he was a candidate who they could control if he won the presidency. End result, he won the presidency. And so, yes, Jimmy Morales then, I believe, encouraged, along with his foreign minister, Carlos Raul Morales, no relation, I'm told, started a campaign of being very harsh and tough on Belize and permitting the Guatemalan armed forces to be tough. Yeah. Now, we saw uh, former minister, former foreign affairs minister for Guatemala, Carlos Raul Morales, very active in this campaign. Yes. In fact, uh, of he, course, he's fighting he for political relevance. He spoke, uh, I think, in, in most media, at most media houses. He was actively calling people out to vote. He's no longer a part of government, yes. but he was obviously allowed to be very involved in this process. Oh, I believe it's more than that. I believe that he was encouraged to be active, but it doesn't take much to encourage Carlos Raul for a number of reasons. He has to recapture some kind of political relevance mm -hmm. in his own country after he was um, ousted from office. Yes, that's the word, ousted. So that he has his own reasons for needing to be relevant. Mm -hmm. Carlos Raul Morales has always pretended, and I will use that word, has always pretended to be super friendly and super um, caring about Belize. Those roots go back to the fact that Carlos Raul Morales started at the beginning of his diplomatic career as a very junior officer in the embassy in Belize. He married a Belizean woman of a very good Belizean family, uh, very well known to a lot of people. And so Carlos Mar Raul Morales spent a lot of years getting to know Belize and Belizeans, or so he thinks very well. The issue is that Carlos Mar Raul Morales always moved in so-called middle-class circles. So those are the people he knows. Mm -hmm. Carlos Raul Morales does not know Belize or Belizeans. What won't we tolerate? We will not tolerate two-facedness. You cannot come and tell us that you love us so much. And they make remarks in the media in Guatemala saying that the BDF is hunting down Guatemalans. We will hear it. And anything you say after that will be colored by the fact that you have chosen to tell a falsehood about the Belize Defense Force. Mm -hmm. The Belize Defense Force does not hunt down Guatemalans. It does not go out of its way to seek out Guatemalans. The Belize Defense Force's role is to protect our border, to patrol our border, and to make sure that people are not committing offenses against the laws of Belize. And they have every right to fulfill that role in the same way that the Guatemalan armed forces have a right on their side of the border. The comments made by Carlos Raul Morales have rightly aggravated Belizeans. Not just this interview, Absolutely. but for many previous interviews. Look, but here's the thing. 
we have spoken to the people in Guatemala and they think no different. They think that one of the interviews, one of the gentlemen said, listen, the British robbed us. We need to take it back. That uh -huh. one person who says, don't worry, Belizeans, you won't need a passport soon to come <laughs> over here. That's, People, that's, Marlene, that is jingoistic propaganda, and you have to understand where that's coming from. For many years, that was the propaganda that you were taught in schools. They, I'm they, willing mm -hmm. to wager you that with the exception of a few young extremists, this is all older Guatemalans talking to you. Mm -hmm. Young people understand that the world has changed. Young people understand that Belize is a nation state with a territory that is intact and mm -hmm. that Guatemala has nothing to get out of this. Mm -hmm. Period. I was going to get and there. And that is a part I of was, the I was, I was going to get there. Because that not only come. that, the 75% yeah. that didn't vote, we don't have the demographic breakdown as yet. For some reason, there are a couple of voting centers that uh, they haven't finalized the votes. Sure. But their voting population is about 41% under, uh, thir under 35. Yes. So we, we anxiously await to see what the demographics the will be for that 26% that came yeah. out. We did speak to young people. And young people do want, a, they, they, they see it as an opportunity to finalize an issue that has been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. They admit to not knowing very much about Belize, yes. and they admit, they acknowledge that Belize is an independent nation. Yes. Now this is based on the 40, 50 people we interviewed. Yeah. So that's nowhere representative to <laughs> yes. the millions that's in Guatemala. But it does give us some insight. Mm -hmm. The point is, though, that these young people we spoke to were at the voting stations. They still went, and mm -hmm. most likely, based on, on what's there, voted yes. Mm -hmm. So Yes, because if somebody's going to show you some beautiful islands and say, would you like to have these islands? If you do, vote yes. yes. Hello. Mm -hmm. That's going to be attractive to some people. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying to you, propaganda plays a very large role mm -hmm. in what is happening. Mm -hmm. In the same way, to go back to our friend Carlos Raul Morales, he has always carried a certain role in propaganda. I will never forget when he came here in 2015 and with his counterpart, the foreign minister of Belize, standing by and saying nothing, actually lied to Belizeans and said that there was an agreement not to do anything on Sarstoon Island not to build anything on Sarstoon Island, mm -hmm. and for the Coast Guard or the BDF not to have any permanent structures in the Sarstoon. I became so incensed by it, Marlene, mm -hmm. that I immediately canvassed my former colleagues in the Foreign Ministry, and we got every single Foreign Minister, including Assad Schumann, from 1981 all the way to 2007, the last of which was me, every single one of us, completely rejected and renounced what Carlos Raul Morales had to say about the Sarstoon, Sarstoon Island, and any permanent structures, because that was a patent lie. Mm -hmm. What bothers me As is that our the then and current foreign, former foreign minister stood by, listened to him say it, and said nothing. I don't care if you're a guest in my country, you're not coming to lie here. The only integrity any foreign minister ever has is their word. That's it. If you lie to me once, you will lie to me again. So for somebody like former Foreign Minister Carlos Raul Morales to carry out this propaganda that they love Belizeans so much, that all we want, all he has ever wanted, is for us to have a settlement of this. And no, it doesn't mean that they're grabbing for Belize. That's a lie. I've heard the man say that there are no boundaries in Belize, mm -hmm. that they can do whatever they like at any time they want, and that there is nothing to stop them other than if a court rules a certain way. Now, if this is someone who, at the very highest levels of the Guatemalan government, is going to make that kind of statement, his now successor, the for current foreign, foreign minister of Guatemala, has a huge hurdle to jump over to convince any Belizean that you're not two-faced and liar. And this is one of the biggest problems that any administration faces in Belize taking this matter to the referendum. Now, let, let's bring the focus now 
on the process that we are at now. Yes. As I said earlier, and, and, that, and I hear your point in terms of 75% not showing up to participate, but as we said, if we were to look at it from a very legal standpoint, just for the fact that it is, it is a legitimate referendum for Guatemala. Theoretically, yes. Yes. For the moment. At this point in time, if, yeah, if nobody challenges it, and, and, and we saw that there were attempts made to, yeah. to make court challenges in Guatemala. But let's look at Belize. This was a very difficult process, I found, for most people that I spoke to, to hear the messages coming out of Guatemala in the campaign period, in the referendum coverage that we provided. And I know it was difficult to do the interviews with Guatemalans because but we need to know what they're thinking. And it's very clear yes. that there are still substantial people in Guatemala who don't know anything about Belize, who don't understand the claim, but feel that they deserve it. And, and they would love to have the gains of what this country has to I offer. I said, if I told you I can give you a wingle if you simply yeah. show up and tick a box, why would you say no? Yeah. Yeah. It's very simple, you know. We have a problem in Belize, and it is this. We need to stop being reactive and start being proactive. What mm -hmm. do I mean by that? My opinion of going to the ICG or not going to the ICG is completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Why? It is my opinion. Mm -hmm. And it is my opinion only. I've put in the homework to arrive at an opinion. I've written on it. I've researched on it. You've worked. And it's my opinion. What Belizeans need to do, because this is an existential crisis for us, is to become as educated as you possibly can. One of the things that surprised me is that every time Guatemala put out this ridiculous map in which they show that they're claiming more than half of the country and all of the islands and keys except St. George's, I was consistently amazed at the fact that Belizeans acted as though this was the first time they had ever seen this thing. Ever since 1990, Vice President Eduardo Stein put this down in writing and it is documented that that is their claim. In a way, I was glad to see it in the propaganda. You know why? Because now we have it firmly cemented as to what it is they're going to go to the ICJ to try to claim. Yeah. So that's the first thing. You can't get upset with these people about their propaganda. That's their propaganda. What we have to do is to become educated about what it is that they want and how we are going to respond. But more importantly, Belizeans deserve to be told by their government what is the plan. I cannot believe what I heard Deputy Prime Minister Patrick Faber say yesterday, which is we haven't discussed it in cabinet yet because Prime Minister not here. Well, first of all, what does he leave an acting Prime Minister to do? I'm not even going to comment on the current office holder. But for the Deputy Prime Minister to admit to Belizeans that they haven't even sat down to have a discussion on this, not even theoretically, as far as I'm concerned, pitch the outer office, becoming a nowhere than do they. You should have already had a plan. You should have already, from the moment you knew this referendum would go ahead, what are we going to do if they vote yes? What are we going to do if they vote no? What does it well, mean? Well, I mean, if one would assume they had enough intel to, knew, to, to yes, know that this would have been how it was going to be. Everybody could have told you that no matter how the vote would go, the turnout would be low. Mm -hmm. That is number one. And that it would Everybody be yes. could have told you that it was going to be a yes vote. Number mm -hmm. two. So that not take rocket science. You should have, however, discussed every possible eventuality. And for our government not to be able to tell us right now what is the plan is their election of duty. That's one. Two, you can't tell me that Alexis Rosado will run an education campaign from Guatemala. Mm -hmm. That is ludicrous. There had better be somebody here on the ground to run an education campaign and not just a yes education campaign. Everybody who wants space to discuss even a no vote should be given that opportunity because we have a democracy. As I <coughs> said before, you have been very vocal on this issue. We see, we see and hear uh, your comments on, on this issue, no matter what's taking place. Yes. How would you gauge 
the level of understanding of the Belizean people okay. of this process? There are several levels. There is, I think, for all of us, the emotional level, yeah. which is a complete and total, tell them people, get off our way back. I don't want to hear nothing from them. That's mm -hmm. one level, emotion. Mm -hmm. The other emotion is fear for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it is fear of not knowing what a court could rule. A lot of that fear is actually born out of practical experience with local courts. And there is a great deal of confusion as to how the ICJ operates. I had a discussion a week ago with a gentleman from a media house in Balmopan who I won't name. And he spent half an hour on the phone trying to convince me that the ICJ will vote as judges individually on an emotional basis. My challenge to him was simple. Find me one judgment in which the International Court of Justice has ruled on emotion and not on law. One judgment, and I will revise my opinion of how the court works. <laughs> the court works on law. But you can't get Belizeans to accept that when too many of them know injustice rather than justice as a result of going to court. So that is the most difficult thing for people to accept. The other thing, because a lot of people don't want to invest the time in reading, is that people, although we have a legal opinion that is written by four of the greatest international jurists that ever lived, that between them have something like 400 years worth of experience, those people have said very clearly, based on everything, based on international law, based on the 1859 treaty, based on the fact that you have administered your territory without any problem for the last 250 plus years, based on the fact that there were not one, there were two boundary commissions. There was an exchange of notes in 1931 by the Guatemalan foreign minister. Mm -hmm. Based on all of these things, but we don't see that there is any risk at all of Belize losing any territory to Guatemala. But people don't want to accept what they don't want to accept, Marlene. Well, and not only that, I think what we are seeing is people are saying, and, and I, can, mm -hmm. I, I can go off the feedback from, from, this, from the information we put sure. out, that there is no need to defend what we know is ours. And except that. And that we except have that borders. There is. We expect yeah. that those borders should be should be respected and and that is all that we must maintain okay. is now and I, and I agree to a point let me tell you to what point i agree we have borders anybody who says that we don't have borders is deluded mm -hmm. not only do we have borders we went to independence with those borders fully intact there was a vote that respected our territorial integrity and the only country that did not vote yes was Guatemala. One. One. What we were told in the same resolution that took us to independence, the same resolution that supported it, because the United Nations does not grant independence. It recognizes you as a country that is eligible for membership, which means you fulfilled all the conditions. And the resolution that approved Belize's membership is the one that also said, you have an issue with Guatemala? Please, Onoko, try settle it. But it did not, however, ratify our borders. We went with our borders intact. Those have been in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. There's no question about what our borders are. The fact that Guatemala will not recognize them is another matter. But when I hear Elrington speak, for instance, as he did in 2008, to say at that time, we have to go to the ICJ because we have a problem on our western border with Guatemala. They don't recognize it. That isn't why we have to go to the ICJ. He wasn't even at the time thinking of 
or speaking of the Sarstone because that wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. But as Foreign Minister said, Ellington knew and has always known that from 1990, Vice President Eduardo Stein of Guatemala said very clearly, we claim half of the country and all of the islands and keys. And that was put down in writing. Mm -hmm. And they have never gone back from that position. Now, we are expecting to move into an intensification of our education campaign. Yes. That's what we've been told would yes. take place following this vote. Yes. By all indications, it is going to be a challenge to get Belizeans to, a challenge is a light word to use, but uh -huh. it is going to be a monumental feat to get Belizeans to vote yes to going to the ICG, based on what we're seeing, based on what we're I'll hearing. I'll make you a prediction. But, but, but I'll let me make say you this. a prediction. Uh -huh. It's going to be an overwhelming no. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be a no because of the same but exact situation where you have a country that professes to love and respect you, but at the same time is claiming more than half and all of your keys, while effectively making a grab at your southernmost border, i.e. the Sarstool, that is continuing to do nothing to prevent its citizens from raping the marine resources mm -hmm. And also our resources in the Chiquibul, whether it be chate, whether it be gold, whether it be animals, whether it be precious woods, mm -hmm. that hasn't stopped. It continues unabated. And at the same time, Belizeans are demonized in Guatemala. I don't care how many Garifuna you invite to come and perform in a peace and culture thing. At the same time that that is going on, and through no fault of those good people who went in good faith to that cultural significance event, at the same time that that is happening, there is a theater performance in which Belizeans are depicted in insulting blackface. And there is not one single Guatemalan official who has the intestinal fortitude to stand up and say, this is not us. This is not who we are. We reject this. This is free speech, so we can't stop it, but we don't subscribe to it. None whatsoever. And then a former foreign minister will tell you, I am not going to apologize for saying that the BDF hunts down Guatemalans. I'm not going to apologize because you people shoot 13-year-old boys. That's ridiculous, Marlene. You know, and Belizeans are not stupid, man. They're listening to this. They're seeing it happen. Everything that happens in Guatemala is magnified in the echo chamber that is social media. Mm -hmm. There are Belizeans who are perfectly bilingual and can see the Guatemalan news and read it, mm -hmm. listen to the Vox Populi, and come to their own conclusions. So this is why I say my opinion, irrelevant. Sede Ellington's opinion, irrelevant. What matters is what each and every citizen reads absorbs, watches, understands, and then acts on. And that's going to be our job. Stop worrying so much, however, about what Guatemala mm -hmm. says. Be aware of it. Mm -hmm. Be aware of it, because you know what they have to You have to know what they are saying. What is more important is to challenge our own government, our own government, not only to effectively educate Belizeans, but to permit space proper space for those who want to say no. Mm -hmm. I have absolutely no fear of debating anybody. And I've done it before. We had a debate that the SSB sponsored at the Bliss. I had absolutely no problem debating the no's. And we won that debate, not by jumping up and down so, on polemics, but, but me, by let talking me make this to clear. people. Let me make this clear. You still see, in your opinion, you still see the ICJ as a viable option no, or I still see the, the ICJ as the best option. possible option. But not now. But what for what? For what? For finding an avenue to resolving the unfounded Guatemalan claim. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt in my mind about that. Mm -hmm. However, the big however there for a lot of Belizeans, and you cannot push it aside or negate it, is the concern as to whether Guatemala will respect those results. I have heard what the new Guatemalan foreign minister says. 
What Foreign Minister Havel says, with all due respect, is the position right now for her government. She cannot speak for future Guatemalan governments, mm -hmm. how they will act or react, and that is a fact. Now, the, we're running out of time so quickly. Sure. Let, me, let me get to this point. We speak of the referendum uh, as a, a part of the process, but I, I think what we need yes. to remind people is that this is an expense. The education campaign yes. will cost you us. You mean the one for which we budgeted $40,000? Well, and a uh, foreign minister has informed <laughs> us that it will be $8 million and that they're looking at international donors to be able to get. Shall I tell you what the donors have said? But let me, let me just. Shall I this. tell you what the donors have said? Mm -hmm. The donors have said, please, ma'am, we'll help you with the referendum. We understand that's an expense. But you must could educate your own people. Nobody's going to give you $8 million to go out and talk to Malaysians. But. And they're certainly not going to give it to you if all you're going to do is to be undemocratic and only allow the yes proponents to have a say. You know, in Guatemala, the, the budgeted, and they have not given an official cost so far, which most people are skeptical. Their budget was 300 million quetzales, which is a, a little bit over 40 million US dollars to do their campaign. That. Nobody believes it. And they've no. not given a, a if total this, final cost. If they cost. spent that, somebody cheated them out of some so, propaganda. Because 75% of everybody didn't even bother well, to Well, either that or it was completely wasted money. And I use it as, as an example to say, we will be investing resources, into educating Belizeans. We will also invest in terms of being able to execute the referendum. And at this point in time, if you were to ask, and I, you know, you, you said that it's your opinion that people will vote no, I think that is somewhat of the consensus at this point in time. Marlene, should most we even, kids. But, but we have agreed to it, yeah. at signing uh, the compromise with, with OAS and Guatemala. Is it an exercise that needs to be done? No. You know why it doesn't need to be done? 75% of Guatemalans didn't turn out. I see no reason why if only one quarter of everyone who was eligible to vote actually turned up, why should we should bother at this time to waste time and resources on holding any referendum. And when there you say is no point. Sometime in the future, mm -hmm. We should think seriously about going back to the fact of having linked referenda. That is the only way that referendum results in Guatemala will not affect referendum results in Belize and vice versa. That's the only way. But at this point where 75% of Guatemalans have not indicated interest in doing anything, there is no point in our spending resources that we do not have in order to get a sure no vote. But isn't it highly unlikely to make that suggestion that uh, at any point the governments would agree to do a joint referenda Why not? after they have been? But we've done it before. We've done it before. And what we should be looking at is looking at the art of the possible. Diplomacy is not the art of the impossible. It's the art of the possible. Mm -hmm. And what is possible? If we signed a compromise in 2008 to hold joint referenda, why can't we do it again? Mm -hmm. If we say to the Guatemalans, we're sorry, but your results indicate that 75% of your country has absolutely no interest in this. We have done the polls in Belize, and our polls say that to go to a vote right now would be a no, and in its own way, that would be disastrous to the process. And we should therefore, at this point in time, take a break, why don't you get off the SAR stone, sign a protocol with us, start living like a good neighbor, mm -hmm. stop beat me if you love me, start behaving as though you want to be a full partner with us, mm -hmm. and let Belizeans see that in living action before you ask any of us to trust you on going to the ICG. That is the only way you are going to come back to some level of confidence and comfort on the part of Belizeans, that this is a worthwhile endeavor. I wrote a paper I, for, um, for uh, St. John's College some time ago, and it was a paper on why we should go. Some of the points are still relevant. Why we should go, for instance, is that 
petroleum deposits make it critical for us to have a decision in place before any significant fines are actually announced. Mm -hmm. It will become much harder then to deal with these issues. And that's only one of the but many, many reasons. But to tell me that we have to go because we don't have borders, that's not a reason. Because we do. But let me, you know, two things are, are standing out. One, mm -hmm. you seem to still, uh, I mean, you've obviously said that you do yeah. see the ICJ as the way to settle this matter. Yes. A lot of Belizeans are saying, what if we vote no? What if we vote no and this process if we vote is essentially no, then we don't a stalemate? Go. Correct. Then we don't go. The message that coming way, out from, our, yes. from the foreign minister is we have no other option that not following That's through. Rubbish. That not following through. I mean, the, we, we spoke of, of being, not, um, being unable to maintain peace based on our size of our military That's versus rubbish. Guatemala size. So what are the options? If, if you're saying mm -hmm. that you don't see why we should do the vote now, and let's say the follow through with the action takes place and we do get a no, if what happens my, then? If my roof starts to leak, what should I do? Depends. Some people put buckets, some people fix it. Correct. But if you don't fix it, it gets worse, right? Mm -hmm. You can ignore it, you know. You could ignore it indefinitely. Mm -hmm. At some point, your roof will collapse. What you do between the first leak and the collapse determines how your quality of life will be. It is really that simple. There is absolutely nothing that will happen to us that is ruinous us at this point if people vote no. If people vote no, there will be many complex reasons why they have voted no, including fear, including emotion, including distrust, and including lack of confidence in this current government. The government cannot have it both ways. You cannot both say, don't use it as a football, but yet say, I'm not to blame if people don't want to deal with this. The government is in charge. It governs, and people have a right to expect it to govern. So yes, it is going to be at their feet, and that's not a political comment. That's a fact of life. So let me ask you. But it is not the end of the world if we vote no. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no reason why if we vote no now that we couldn't go to a referendum in two years. In fact, our referendum act, years, does it have anything in place that hinders us from taking the same issue absolutely back? Absolutely not. So absolutely theoretically, not. theoretically Not even speaking. theoretically. It can be done as many times as you want it done. Let me tell you that in Scotland, there have been at least four or five votes in recent memory as to whether Scotland should leave the union or not. To this date, the vote is a no. Next time they hold it, it could be a yes. The same with Brexit. There have been votes over the years as to whether Britain should leave the UK. Votes were no until it became a yes. And now there is talk that there should be another one to see whether people want to reverse that, yes. So this notion somehow that any referendum result is binding forever and ever, amen, is a farce. It's a fallacy. That is not true. Let me ask you one final, because we're really sure. out of time. One final question. You believe in the ICJ process in finalizing this matter. Yes. In your mind, I keep saying what I would think be, it's the best possible option. What would be, and I, and I want to make it yeah. clear in the conversation, yes. which is I keep repeating it. In your mind, what can be said to Belizeans to progress this process forward? You've Nothing. done many education. Nothing, and I will tell you what what will make a difference. It's not what can be said to Belizeans, you know. It will what, be the ones who vote. Hear me. It is what Guatemala does that will make a difference to Belizeans. If you start to behave like the good neighbor you say you are, stop chasing civilians on the SAR stone. Stop preventing the BTV or whoever from visiting the SAR stone. Stop aggressing us in our protected areas. Stop encouraging or stop having any effort to dissuade your citizens from coming over and using gillnets and from killing all of the gibnut in the chikibul 
and from stop panning gold, stop dumping mercury in our waters, stop chopping down trees. That is the only way that Belizeans will start to have the kind of confidence that they have in Mexico and start having that kind of confidence in Guatemala. We absolutely love Mexico. It is a good neighbor. It has always behaved as a good neighbor to the point that most Belizeans don't even know that all of the boundary markers are not set on our northernmost boundary. But because Mexico and Belize have the type of respectful relationship where this is not a problem, we cooperate very, very well. Okay. And when Guatemala starts to behave towards us the way that Mexico does, because I've never heard of any blackface performance in Mexico called, you know, wear Belize or goodbye Belize or whatever Belize. When Guatemala starts to behave like that, and behaves like that for an appreciable length of time, that is when Belizeans will believe. Because Belizeans are no different from anybody else. They want to feel it in their flesh. They want to put their fingers in the wound and say, Sitya, I believe you. You treat me good. We are having a harmonious relationship. And so therefore, yes. But right. there are things that our government has to do, Marlene. And one of the first is to deal with the Sarstone okay. situation. You know what I would do if I was the government? One well, simple thing. I would simply declare all of our internal waters in the Sarstone to be protected areas. One, so that nobody can go fishing, nobody can do anything. I would have regular and frequent patrols, and I would permit any group of citizens who wants to go, to go there. In fact, if it was left up to me, I would probably have regattas up and down the Sarstone anytime I feel like it. And I would build a Coast Guard base right on Sarstoon Bloody Island because that is the only vantage point from which you can see a far ways down the river and all of the mouth of the river. Where it is located right now is not adequate. It is only until our government does those things that give people confidence and the Guatemalan state behaves towards Belize as a good neighbor that you will ever get any chance of Belizeans ever being confident about any process that tries to settle this. All right. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing your perspective today. We appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we'll be talking about LeaderCast 2018. So stay tuned.